This video is about dopamine. Now this is a neurochemical that's really important for happiness, but also just our quality of day-to-day -day life and how effective we are and how successful we are because it's responsible for things like uh, motivation and taking action. So in this video, we'll explain a little bit about how it works, some of the principles behind it, and then I'll offer you a few supports or tools that you can use to sort of optimize or manage having healthy levels of dopamine. So let's start. Now dopamine, as I said, is a neurochemical that kind of governs what we can think of as the pursuit of things out there. So if you think about this in an evolutionary context, it would kind of go like this, you know, so I'm a caveman. And as you can see, I haven't trimmed my neck lately. So I kind of look like one, you know, I'm a caveman, a cave woman. And, you know, I get up one morning and I'm like, shoot, we don't have a lot of uh, fish and berries right now. And I don't think we have much water. So upon realizing that, there's likely going to be a release in dopamine. And as that dopamine floods into my system, I feel more activated and more energized that I want to go out and look for food, look for water, look for berries, look at all these things. And so it's actually this rise above baseline that causes me to feel motivated and take action. Uh, and then once I find the food or find the water, I find the resources, there is a corresponding drop often to below baseline and then right i'm gonna feel more chill and relax and i don't really feel like doing anything because i have all the stuff if you didn't have that drop back down right you would find the resources and then you would just feel like oh i need to keep getting more and more and more and from an evolutionary perspective that would not be a very useful way of managing your energy uh, and interestingly you know i use this sort of biological example uh, this chemical dopamine is responsible for the same thing of uh, goal seeking and goal pursuit and taking action and motivation in pretty much every animal, even like worms have this, right? So thinking about how this chemical works, it turns out there's no such thing as like a dopamine hit, right? We often hear that uh, if you hit a vape or a jewel, you get a hit of dopamine, or as you look through social media, you get a hit. And it's true that, you know, dopamine is involved in that entire process, but it's not like something that we just get a hit of, so to speak. In fact, there's a baseline, okay, so there's a baseline level with peaks and troughs, with peaks above baseline and even drops or dips below baseline. In the literature, this is known as tonic and phasic release. So there's really kind of two pathways of how this neurochemical is released. Tonic being the kind of baseline level circulating in your brain and blood all the time. And then the phasic release are those kind of peaks and drops that I talked about. And it turns out it's this spread really between those peaks and baseline that determines our felt experiences of things like pleasure, but also excitement or motivation or just energy. So the baseline determined by things like your genetics, your sleep, your habits, and your nutrition, and actually importantly, your dopamine levels from prior days. So, you know, if the maybe for a few days you were like you know partying and going really hard and having a great time and maybe you also got some hard workouts in and you you know accomplished this big task right you were training for a marathon you ran the marathon and then you celebrated for three days and partying and all that it's likely that you know baseline on that following monday you're gonna have a really bad case of the you know sunday scaries going into monday because your levels are going to be dropped below there are also things that can be uh, used to trigger peaks, you know, from things that we consume, actions we take, and even, you know, thoughts we have, right? Maybe you've had this experience of you have a talk or a presentation coming up, and just by thinking about it, you feel a little bit of nervous energy, like, oh, I need to do more preparation for this. Or you have something coming up that you're really excited about, and you can even just by thinking about it trigger some of that. Uh, but a few examples, uh, chocolate can lead to 150% increase, sex, and you know this is the kind of pursuing sex or the actual act of it, something like a 200% increase above baseline. Nicotine, 250%, but it's very immediate. Like if you smoke a cigarette, it's like you know a transient kind of rush of dopamine, uh, and then you're you know fall back down to baseline. Amphetamine, it's a thousand percent. So these are things like your Adderall, Vyvanse. Uh, and exercise, 200% increase. And importantly, and interestingly, this is something we'll talk about a little bit, if you enjoy exercise, you tend to get that, that cascade or that peak of dopamine. But if you don't enjoy it, 
it actually doesn't really increase it much at all. So it turns out that you know part of this increase is governed by our perception of the events and if we're doing things that we like to do. So you know, we've talked there a little bit about how this works, right? Where you have the baseline and peaks and troughs and things you can do to kind of create those peaks, but we should use caution in this because although it feels good when we have a peak of dopamine, over time it can actually diminish our drive and our motivation and the sustainability of that. And that's because when we have a peak, there's a corresponding drop Okay, and that drop is proportional to the size of the peak. And like I said, it usually takes us actually back to below baseline. And so you can almost think of it, it's uh, of course not a very scientific analogy. It's a bit of an oversimplification, but it's kind of like money. If we uh, take out a loan to spend a bunch of money today, we're going to have to pay that back in the future. So you know, similarly, if you continue to peak dopamine, even from various sources, it can lead to maybe a sort of like burnout feel a little bit, or at least the very least kind of a, a dampening of our experience of the same activities that once brought us joy. So think, think about this made up example, right? You have someone who maybe works a very competitive sales job during the week and you know, throughout the week they're hitting their sales goals and it's like, oh, this is awesome. I hit my goal. I hit my goal. I hit my goal. And then they also are into CrossFit. So they do their hard workouts and whatnot. And then they you know, come home and say, I worked out hard. I hit my sales goal. I'm going to have a nice big dinner to celebrate with all my friends. And then the weekend comes around and maybe they do uh, action sports and then they go out at night and they you know, work hard, play hard, right? They party and all that sort of thing. Now, this is not, certainly, this is not to say you should not uh, engage in activities that are fun. Of course, we should enjoy ourselves and live life to the fullest. But in this case, what they're doing is they're spiking or peaking that dopamine again and again and again, even though it's from different sources, right? It's the, the work thing, the workouts, the dinners, the parties, the activities. And it's likely that even if they're not doing drugs or something like that, that eventually you're going to start to kind of, you get what's called hedonic adaptation, right? So it turns out dopamine plays a key role in this. This is the idea that when we get stimulated or we get pleasure from something, the more we get that, the more we adapt to it. It kind of loses its edge, right? We get used to it. Uh, you can imagine if you were really into social media. So there's probably other, and I would say probably, there certainly are, other negative mental health aspects associated with that, but whatever, let's say you're just really into it, you love TikTok. Well, if you scroll for two hours a day, you know, after probably a week, you're not gonna probably be getting the same level of engagement or joy or sort of uh, high, so to speak, from engaging in that social media. Now, if you were to take a week off social media and then get back on, you would start to kind of get that again because your baseline dopamine levels will have recovered. So whether it's that social media example, or like I said, this example of this maybe work hard, play hard type person that's you know, getting all of these rushes and high energy peaks throughout the week, you know, it could be that at a certain point, if a person like this starts to just feel like, oh, I'm doing all the same things, I'm kind of doing okay at work, and you know, I still have some fun and a party, but it just doesn't maybe feel like uh, you know, the same sort of juice, it may be that you need to take a step back a little bit and, you know, not to say you should isolate yourself or, you know, stop showing up at work or stop working out, um, but maybe, you know, toning it down a little bit or going on maybe a week-long retreat, just doing some activities that sort of, you know, limit these big peaks again and again and again and start to just level out that uh, baseline a little bit. So I understand that that's a bit of a tricky example, right? Because again, it's not to say we shouldn't enjoy ourselves or do things that are fun, but it's just trying to uh, manage and be a little bit caution around going from like peak to peak to peak all the time, because that's going to start to help uh, or start, I shouldn't say help, it's going to start to sort of hinder uh, your baseline levels of dopamine. So along this same line, right, we talk about how, you know, whether it's many different things or particularly one thing, right, if you are into social media or video games or a certain style of exercise or you know, really anything, you know, gambling, porn, right, all of these things can quickly become addictive. But even if it's a, a kind of a healthy, broad array of things that sort of give you this, this peak of dopamine, that you need to give yourself some time and space to let that rebound, Okay, so along similar lines, 
we need to be careful in using rewards, right? Extrinsic sources of motivation. So in the psychological literature, there's a pretty well-established concept. You can have intrinsic motivation, which comes from enjoyment with the sake of activity itself or the kind of pleasure from doing it. And, you know, it's making me grow, right? So it's like intrinsic motivation is internally grounded, whereas extrinsic motivation is I want the money that comes from it or I want the status that comes from it or I hate working out, but I want to have a six pack, right? Those are all extrinsic. And it turns out that extrinsic rewards or motivations can eventually undermine our intrinsic motivation, which makes us less likely to sustain the behavior over the long term. So a study they did with this is they took children who were intrinsically motivated. So remember, that means that they liked it. They just did it on their own. They were intrinsically motivated to draw and they started giving them little rewards for drawing. So they did that for a time and then they stopped giving them rewards. And what happened? Children stopped drawing. So that's kind of a sad example, right? Where these children who loved this activity, they did it for its own sake. Once they started getting rewards associated with it, totally diminished their intrinsic motivation. So we need to be careful with that. And that takes us into the final sort of points here around tools or things that we can do that are supportive of healthy levels of dopamine. And I'll start with that rewards piece because we just talked about it. So there's something called random intermittent rewards. And I think in the literature, there's some acronym RITR or something, but you basically think of it as the slot machine effect. So how do slot machines feel so addictive and keep people playing? Well, it's because you're doing a behavior, right? You pull the lever. So you're doing the behavior every time, but the reward you get is random, right? So it's like one out of every 10 times you win a little bit and you don't know how much you're going to win. And that sort of mimics what happens in our natural state, right? You go out and hunt and you do the activity, you don't get the rabbit or the deer every time. So that random reward cycle is actually very addictive and makes us kind of feel more engaged and that we want to keep doing it. And so you think about a, maybe a simple example that sounds a little ridiculous, but even if you don't do it exactly this way, I think you'll start to understand the mechanism is maybe you think of something you do an activity or an accomplishment that deserves a reward, right? It was a big deal. You did your hard workout, you hit the sales goal, whatever. Maybe you flip a coin and if it's heads, you celebrate and you recognize the accomplishment and you, you know, have your protein bar after the workout or you have your glass of wine for hitting the sales goal. Or you flip a coin and it's tails and you simply do nothing. You just kind of carry on as if nothing important happened. So I get this sounds maybe a little bleak or something or like, oh, you gotta savor your wins. And I think there's something to be said for that, but it's simply saying that if every time you do the thing that you need to do or it's important to you to do, that every time you do it, if you kind of mentally have this reward of, oh, I did the thing, and then you know maybe do some external reward, eventually that may undermine your motivation. Whereas if you have this random intermittent reward cycle, again, the slot machine effect, it's likely that you're almost going to be uh, positively addicted to that behavior, which in the context of this, of things like, I don't know, exercise or reading or learning or accomplishing tasks or studying, right? That kind of positive addiction is a good thing. So beyond the kind of uh, random slot machine effect to your rewards, there's some other maybe simpler things we can do. So caffeine at a reasonable dosage uh, is shown to upregulate dopamine. So importantly, this doesn't mean it increases dopamine, but the sort of receptors responsible for um, dopamine it almost makes you more sensitive to it so that you're more likely to uh, get those uh, healthy peaks from whatever activities or other things you are going to do anyway. Avoid bright light throughout the night and get morning sunlight for about 10 minutes. This supports higher baseline levels of circulating dopamine. And a final thing to consider is cold exposure. Now this one's a pretty powerful tool. So one study looked at exposure to very cold water, about 50 degrees, uh, you know, in the 50s, let's say from 50 to 60 ish. Gets you an immediate release of adrenaline. Maybe that feeling of, oh, I'm alert, I'm cold. This kind of sucks, but I, I'm, I'm awake followed by, interestingly, a slower rise in dopamine for up to about three hours after, uh, leading to a 250% increase, roughly. So there you have it. Caffeine, dark, dark time at night, sunlight in the morning, 
cold exposure and kind of random intermittent rewards are going to help you to manage your dopamine levels. Again, dopamine being this thing that we all have circulating within us and sort of that baseline level is going to determine a lot of our day-to-day -day mood and also our sense of like motivation and energy and drive. And then when we get those peaks, right, which we need to carefully manage, right, those peaks are what really get us into these states of like feeling good, getting after it, excited, motivated, and even pleasure, right? But then usually we're going to get a little drop after, which even just understanding that can help us maybe make sense of our day-to-day -day experience of life and sort of manage our motivation and drive over the long term so that we have healthy levels of both enjoyment and achievement. So I hope this video was helpful. Uh, here's a video that YouTube suggests you'll like. As always on this channel, I share practical insights from the arts, and in this case, a bit more of the sciences to help you be happier in daily life. So thanks for watching. This has been Jackson Kurchis, and I'll see you next time.